I'd like to call up uh, one of our former chairman of, of our board, the Georgia Public Policy Foundation, uh, former commissioner for the Georgia Department of Economic Development, has been done great things for our state and uh, has done great things for our foundation. And uh, pleased to have him come introduce our speaker, Craig Lesser. Thank you, Kelly, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. We did learn at this table here today that uh, Roger said all these great things about all the things that Kelly does and has done over at the Policy Foundation uh, on an everyday basis, but we did find out there's one thing he can't do. He cannot fix the ribbon on Roger's typewriter. <laughs> it is uh, a great honor and a great pleasure for me to be introducing our guest today, Commissioner Michael Thurman of the Georgia Department of Labor. And we're in a tough economy. We're in a very, very tough time. We all are experiencing this. And this morning, while I've known Michael for a long time and worked with him for many years, I thought, well, just to be on the safe side, let me Google Michael Thurmond and make sure I've got some of the basics down. And so I did, and I discovered that the first 30 entries for were for, and this is a tough t economic time, the first 30 entries were for Michael Thurmond's six-day weight loss program. <laughs> I have no idea what that relationship is with what he does every day, but we may find out. Michael Thurman has been Commissioner of the Georgia Department of Labor since 1998. He served 12 years in the Georgia House. Uh, he has a beautiful wife, a gorgeous daughter who's at the University of Georgia that we heard great things about here at, at our table today. But uh, let me tell you two or three things about, about Michael Thurman that I know from my experience with him. One is, this year I served on a number of panels with him. You don't want to be on a panel with him because the audience could care less what you have to say. They are interested in hearing from one of the most captivating speakers this state has ever produced in its leadership. And you're about to find out what Michael Thurmond is all about. If you've never heard him, you will be uh, delighted with what you hear today. You may not like some of the things you hear, because he's very frank, he's very candid, he puts it on the table, but he's also extraordinarily captivating in his speaking style. But I also have to tell you about something that I know we worked together on and I was most pleased to be a part of. Uh, obviously, we heard earlier this week about the startup of production at the Kia facility in West Point, Georgia, which is a great accomplishment for our state. Many, 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 many people had so much to do with it. And about, well, after they got all settled and were starting to build the plant and the HR team at the plant came together, they asked if I could set up a meeting with Commissioner Thurman to start looking at how we could go through the employment recruitment process because they wanted to get it right. And so we met with Commissioner Thurman and in short order, he took the lead. He took the lead in working with Kia and its top executives to develop an online program to recruit and interview prospective employees. Now, when you think that in less than 90 days, more like 60 days, they got 43,000 applicants and they did everything online in a program developed and executed by Commissioner Thurman and his people. There is not a happier organization in our state than Kia Motors Manufacturing of Georgia, who had the opportunity to work with our speaker, Commissioner Michael Thurman. Commissioner? Good afternoon. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Lesser for the kind words of introduction, and, and more importantly, I want to thank him for our personal friendship that we've shared for many years, and as a Georgian for the outstanding work that he has done to generate and spur economic development in our state. This man has played a role, a unique role, in maintaining jobs and, and growing and developing our workforce and just bringing new industry into our state. So let's give Craig a hand. There's no one like him. No one. 
I want to thank Rogers Wade, my longtime friend who we've known each other for a long time. And Rogers is a legend in Georgia politics. He knows where all the bones are buried <laughs> because he helped bury half of them. And uh, uh, he's doing a great job here with the Public Policy Foundation. And thank you so much, Rogers. Kelly, thank you. And congratulations. Uh, Kelly and I traveled all over the state of Georgia together about 10 years ago. No, it's been more than 10 years ago now. Uh, it's about uh, 18, you know, about 14, 15 years ago uh, when uh, I was uh, leading the effort to reform welfare. Uh, Kelly and I held a road show, and uh, we would go to all these communities and all these all-black audiences, and uh, I would always say, Kelly's the problem. And, uh, <laughs> And no matter where we went, he stayed close to me, you know, and I didn't understand that. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> so, uh, but we've developed a friendship that uh, lasts to this day. And I want to thank the Georgia Public Policy Foundation for your work. You all have helped to elevate the discussion and the debate and developing issues and strategies that have been implemented and will be implemented to improve the quality of life uh, in this state. Uh, people who meet me almost invariably say, oh, you're the labor commissioner. And they say, oh, we feel, we feel sorry for you. So you have the toughest job in the state. And just this morning, we were out in Cobb County and uh, uh, at a chamber event, and someone noted that they had decided to get a, invite an inspirational speaker. And one of the people in the room who was in charge of developing the invitation list said, well, you do know he is the labor commissioner, don't you? There's no way he could be inspirational about anything right now. So as I speak, as I speak, there are 15 million Americans officially unemployed. As I speak, there are over 500,000 Georgians officially unemployed. Uh, since the recession began in December 2007, some 8 million Americans have lost their jobs. As I speak, more than 300,000 are receiving unemployment insurance benefits here in the state of Georgia. These are challenging times. We're in the midst of an economic downturn that's really unparalleled, unprecedented, at least since uh, the last Great Depression. As I speak, as I speak, the ratio of job seekers to job openings stands at six to one, highest ratio ever recorded. Six job seekers for every one job opening. What that means, my friends, is that five of those job seekers are looking for something that does not presently exist. Interestingly enough, of those eight million job losses, of those eight million job losses, Three out of every four Americans who've lost their job has been male, has been a man. We uh, developed what we call a white paper I wrote at the Georgia Department of Labor and suggested that the recession in many ways should be returned or uh, uh, recoined as a he session. And in Georgia, interestingly enough, if you go back to December 2007, at that point, in terms of Georgians receiving unemployment insurance benefits, of the four major demographic groups, the largest group in December 07 was African American females, and the smallest were white males. Well, since the recession began, we've seen a nearly 180% increase in the number of white males who are drawing unemployment benefits. So today, the largest demographic subgroup receiving unemployment benefits in the state of Georgia are white males, and the smallest, black females. Now, why did that happen? It happened because you and I know that the two industries that's been most hard hit have been in construction and manufacturing, two areas that are dominated by men. That's challenging. Even more significant, we did an analysis of the enrollments at our two and four year institutions, at our technical colleges. By the way, when we have one of the finest uh, technical colleges network anywhere in this country, 
uh, in our training programs uh, provided through the Georgia Department of Labor. And interestingly enough, even though men represented about 56% of those uh, who've lost their jobs, if you look at enrollments in technical colleges, two and four year institutions, men comprise about 28% of those enrollments, even in the technical school, Craig, which is interesting, isn't it? You wouldn't think that. So what we have is this disparity. Large number of men losing their job, fewer men taking advantage of education and training opportunities, which is creating what we talk and what we know as is structural unemployment. And I see this as the greatest challenge that we are facing economically in our state. Why? It, it doesn't matter whether you're male or female, if you lose your job, there's an economic impact. Well, study after study has shown, and one of the three things we pointed out, that men often define themselves and their ability to support their wife, their families. And they, more than females, define themselves in terms of the jobs or occupations that they hold. So we are now in the midst of a cycle where in Georgia, tens of thousands and across America, tens of millions of men, because they are structurally unemployed, their skill sets are not those skill sets needed to find jobs in the new economy. Many of them are now unable to provide the support and assistance to themselves and their families. One of the public policy issues that I think must be addressed is how we can develop curriculums and training modules and encourage more men to go back to school to seek new training so that they can reskill and up themselves to take advantage of the opportunities that will be presented in the future. Now, it is tough, but let me tell you, the good news, the news that inspires me, the reality that I carry with me every day, is that we must not forget that America has faced tougher economic challenges than the ones we face today. We must not forget that America has faced greater international challenges than the ones we face today. And every time America and Americans have not only met the challenges that have been presented, we have overcome these challenges. And I am convinced beyond all reasonable doubt that America will once again meet and overcome the challenges we face domestically and internationally. But not we, we won't just meet them, we're going to overcome them, and we will exit this recession still with the greatest economy on the face of this earth, still with the most productive workforce on the face of this earth, and still, as I paraphrase President Lincoln, the last best hope for mankind on the face of this planet. Now, how do we do it? One of the things I've suggested is that first and foremost, we must begin to look at ourselves as our enemies look at us. And what do I mean by that? Yesterday over in Covington, I had the chance to meet with and talk with a sergeant who had completed 21 missions, combat missions. And he was working on a project of uh, providing Thanksgiving meals for our brave young men who are serving there in Afghanistan and Iraq. One of the things I walked away from my discussion with him is this. When and if we look at ourselves as our enemies look at us, we'll be able to overcome any challenge that presented to us. What do I mean? You see, when those Islamic terrorists plant IUDs on the highways and byways of Afghanistan, and when they explode those deadly devices, they make no distinction for the soldiers who are black and the soldiers who are white. When the snipers secret themselves in hidden places, they make no distinction between the American soldiers who voted Republican or the American soldiers who voted Democrat. When the assassin in Fort Wood opened fire on our soldiers, he offered 
no quarter to any soldier in that room. He had one mission. So I submit to you that when we began to see ourselves, first and foremost as Americans and not as to the things that separate us, we will meet the challenge, we will defeat the enemy, and we will continue to protect American values and ideas. What does that have to do with this economy? Everything. Because this recession has been no respecter of person or position. There's not a single person in this room who do not know a former colleague, a son, a daughter, a neighbor, a friend, a church member who's not been impacted by this recession. There's not a person in this room who does not know someone who's lost a job. And see, as the labor commissioner, and Rogers, you know I tell people, I'm not the same man I was in December 07. This recession, Ann, has changed me, Mike, Maria, and it's changed me. I see clearly now. And let me tell you what I see clearly. When I walk into a plant in North Georgia, South Georgia, East Georgia, West Georgia, the people who are unemployed, and I've talked to literally thousands and just like us, a men and women who've lost their job, lost their pension, lost their health care. Some lose their cars, lose their houses. Some lose their families. Many simply lose hope and faith. I see clearly now. They don't ask me much about my college degrees or where I went to law school. The only question they ask is, can you help me find a job? so I can support my family, so I can put food on the table, so I can keep a roof over my family's head. It's simple, Kevin. It's simple. Now, news flash. I'm the vice chair of the Democratic Party of Georgia. The Democratic Party does not have an answer to all the problems that we face here in the state of Georgia. News flash. Neither does the Republican Party. I do believe, though, that Americans can develop answers to the problems that we face. I think as far as time that we got the best minds, not the best Democratic minds or the Republican minds, but the best minds, put them in a room and develop the solutions we need. It's what the Public Policy Foundation is all about. It's about great ideas and good ideas and practical ideas that will address the problems that we face. He said, well, it's easy for you to say. But you know what? It's not about me. I tell my people who work with me at the Labor Department, you know, as tough as it is, we have thousands of people walking in the door every day. People are frustrated. People are angry. But you know what? We still have our job. I'm so happy that now employment is finally being placed at the top of the agenda in Washington. I hope employment is soon placed at the top of the agenda here in the state of Georgia. You know, we've had this disconnect. We, we, we present the consumer sentiment surveys, and somehow we've disconnected the fact that consumers, in order to consume, you basically you need what? A job. How do we generate jobs? I think it's clear. Uh, I support tax credits that will incentivize the hiring of jobs. But I also recognize that we also need to make some strategic and key investments right now. If we're going to maintain our competitive advantage against our sister state and against other nations, if 500,000 Georgians are unemployed, if tens of thousands of men are not working and, and do not have the skills needed to work, it's a great time to re-educate and reskill that workforce. The businesses, the states, the individuals who make the strategic investments today will have huge competitive advantages tomorrow. See, the intuition tells me that yes, we should cut and cut and cut and cut and cut, and that's, I don't disagree. But we also have to think and say, where should we invest? And the one place we can never divest ourselves from is the education and training of our children. That is the future of this state. And so consequently, no matter what political ideologies we may have or not have, we can never obscure the fact of the power of public 
and private education. I stand here today, I'm a living, breathing testament as to the power of public education in Georgia. I tell folks, I'm the product of three generations of Georgia sharecroppers. My daddy was a Georgia sharecropper with no education. My grandfather was a sharecropper with no education. My father's father's father sharecrop with no education. So I tell folks, by right, all I should ever hope to be is what? A sharecropper. And quite frankly, if you look at me and see anything other than a sharecropper, you need to look a little closer. I have the spirit and the soul of a Georgia sharecropper. And sharecroppers have two major characteristics. Number one, they believe in hard work. And number two is they can take a little bit and do a whole lot. So I am a Georgia sharecropper. It's just that I'm a sharecropper with a law degree. And that makes me a bad man. <laughs> so let us go from this place looking for the best ideas. You know, it can't be all cut, 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 and it can't be all tax and spin. You know, I had a dream that the solution was some cuts and some spending. I can't discount or reject an idea from Kelly simply because I believe Kelly might be a part of a party different than the one I have. The folk who are unemployed, the folk I see, they don't care where the job comes from. They don't care where the good idea comes from. They don't care who provides the opportunity and the training. All they really want is to support themselves, their family, and their children. Well, keep thinking critically and honestly and openly. Open up the debate and maintain it. Seek fresh ideas and new ideas. This is how we will move from where we are to where we need to be. I'll leave you with this. I'm excited. I'm inspired. I'm enthused about the future of Georgia. I'm not depressed. I'm not downtrodden. I know this recession started and recession start and recession's in. They always have and they always will. But more importantly, I see something else taking place in Georgia. There's an article I read this morning in the New York Times. It was from Henry County, Georgia. And it's interesting, in the article was that the recession is bringing people together in Henry County in a way they haven't been brought together before. That snare is not just who's black, who's right, who's rich, who's poor, who's Republican, who's dead. Look, we all are in need. And we all know somebody's hurting. And now it's time for all of us to put our shoulder to the test and to get this ox cart out the ditch. See, we're going to live in a Georgia, this new Georgia, this new vision I have for Georgia, that is not separated by North Georgia and South Georgia. We will live in that Georgia. We will live in a Georgia not separated by black and white and rich and poor. We'll live in a Georgia that when it comes to education and training of our children, we'll be smart enough and intelligent enough not to separate ourselves between Republicans and Democrats. I'm convinced beyond all reasonable doubt that if we continue to pray together and work together, we can build, we will build one Georgia, one great Georgia for one great one Atlanta, one Fulton, one Georgia, one America. One America. That is as we have pledged that it should be since we were little boys and girls. One America that is what? Under God. One America that is indivisible, that cannot be divided and segmented and broken and sliced and diced. But one America that offers liberty and justice and jobs <laughs> to all. Thank you. The commissioner has a few moments to take a question or two, and there's one right back up here to start us off. Hi. I was at the Georgia State Economic Forecasting session this morning with Rajiv. There's two things that jumped out at me I'd like you to react to. He's projecting losing 60,000 more Georgia jobs next year. And the two areas where there were growth were health care and education. 
Is that consistent with what you're seeing in the future? Uh, yes, it is. As a matter of fact, and, and Craig and Rogers and I, we were talking about it over lunch, uh, that if you look at the Georgia metropolitan areas where you have a cluster or either military base, a regional hospital, or a state university, you have a recession-resistant economy that if, not, if it's not growing, and many of them are, it has, been, it has weathered the storm much more so than other parts of the state. Look around Georgia, military bases, regional hospitals, major universities. Craig was talking about Valdosta, where you have Valdosta State University. And the two areas that continues to grow was, was uh, medical services, health care, and in education. So I think he's right. Uh, I hope he's wrong, to be quite honest with you. But if he's right, we still have 12 more very difficult months to travel before we come to the end of the recession. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I uh, applaud your bipartisan analysis and, and your encouragement. Um, is there something, is there anything or any routes that the uh, uh, use Commissioner of Labor uh, in concert with uh, other executive leadership and or the legislature can do to incentivize or regulate uh, getting our, uh, our unemployment compensation recipients uh, I won't say forced, but encouraged uh, strongly to start ramping up their educational things. It's, it's so clear. Now, I think Georgia and the country can learn a lot from our armed forces in our human resource management. When a technical MOS, military occupational specialty, is made obsolete by technology, <coughs> all those soldiers, airmen, Marines, etc., are retrained off, you know, into other fields. So we don't lose people that want to be so, uh, and we need to get white males and everybody else to, if they're too proud to go get educated, we need to incentivize them in some way to shepherd them in that direction. Yeah, that's I, my question. Sir. No, it's, it's a great question and actually it's a great statement. Uh, one of the things I've done, and today we're going to release our new unemployment rate for the state of Georgia for last month, and it will be up a little, is that we need a summit of the best minds in the state of Georgia, in the public and the private sector, to actually sit down in a room and develop, if you want to call it bipartisan, tripartisan, doesn't really matter to me, a develop a strategy for Georgia so that we can claim uh, our economic destiny. See, one of the things that this recession has shown is that the old systems and the old strategies are not working right now. Tomorrow, we're going up to Dalton. We're having a big job fair up there. Well, and one thing about the Dalton leaders, the chamber, and the political leaders is they are re-envisioning their regional economy. It worked perfectly for them for 60 years. For instance, when the textile manufacturers and the cut and sew people came to Georgia 60, 70 years ago, it, it was just like Kia coming. And all across rural Georgia, when a plant came to town, whether it was Thomas the Mills or Fruit of the Loom, that was the Kia of 60 years ago. When they came from north to south looking for cheaper labor, lesser taxes, and so forth. So now we need to begin to think about what will the next 60 years be like here in Georgia? What's the vision? What's the thinking? I was reading a, story, a, a speech that the, the New South speech that Henry Grady gave in the late 1800s. He envisioned what really has laid the groundwork for what we are really enjoying now today in the New South. We need a new New South strategy in terms of what will this state look like and the main thing we're going to have to do is invest in our people. I can't see, and I want to go on record, I can't see cutting another billion dollars out of public education. You can't afford it. You say, what do you mean you can't afford it? You can't afford to pay it or you can't afford to cut it? You can't afford to cut it. Because what you're really cutting is not so much your budget, but you are cutting future opportunities for your children and my children and our grandchildren. Yes, I wanted to follow up on that. Um, as a uh, an economic developer, in meeting with uh, communities that are underinvested and underemployed, uh, people will say, "Please, 
please bring me a job that I can do. And it is very hard to say the truth, which is they are all gone and you have to change. So I would be interested in how you handle that with underskilled and underemployed Georgians. Thank you. It's a great question. And I have to, you know, I'm standing here with our political and business leaders. Uh, more often than not, I'm standing in, in a room with 50, 100, 200, 1,000 people who just lost everything, who hadn't been to school in 15 or 20 years, who dropped out of high school. And first of all, I encourage them to keep the faith. And that sounds simple, but faith is so important. But also, you have to continue to believe in the American dream and the power of America, in that they are skilled and to educate them about, not just about the HOPE scholarship, but also about the HOPE grant. I found that 95% of Georgians never heard of the HOPE grant and have absolutely no idea that every resident of Georgia, if they go to one of our technical colleges, is eligible to receive the HOPE grant, which will pay for, for just about all, all of your uh, fees and tuition. But 95% of Georgians never heard of it. So you have to begin to educate our population as to where the resources are and what it will mean to get additional education. Do I have a panacea, a magic wand? No, it's one person at a time. It's just like joining the church. You've got to keep opening up the doors of the church every Sunday and allowing people to come in. Mike? Commissioner, thank you. Uh, a couple of questions. On the HOPE grant, we know that the revenue line and the expense line on that is not in great shape. Your thoughts on whether the HOPE grant is vulnerable, but the first question that I really wanted to ask you is, in the question of a possible second federal stimulus, there's been some discussion that that may be to create public sector government jobs. I'd like to know your thoughts on whether public sector government jobs ought to be the focus of a second stimulus, if there is a second stimulus, or where should the balance be? Well, I think federal, state, and local government really need to focus either new resources or existing resources on creating private sector jobs. To be honest, with you, it's private sector jobs. Uh, that's what's lacking right now, and uh, and it's not just new money. Uh, one of our initiatives, Georgia Works, uh, really re envisions how we use the unemployment insurance program to help incentivize job creation and hiring in the private sector. Uh, if there was a deficit in the latest strategy, is that not enough focus and resources? were targeted towards the private sector, and particularly to small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, as for the HOPE grant, uh, I think the HOPE grant is the key resource that can help us re-educate, retrain the unemployed workforce, more so than the HOPE scholarship. I think it's the most significant resource we have right now in the state of Georgia. I'll take one more, and then we'll call. We'll close. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner, what was your position on the uh, jobs tax cut that was passed by the General Assembly and vetoed by the um, governor in the past legislative session? And what would your position be if the same legislation was introduced in January? Well, I helped. Actually, I, that was my idea. And, uh, <laughs> and the Republican leadership in the House, uh, obviously that's where the votes are. Uh, we worked together to get it passed. And it was a credit uh, that was tied to the unemployment insurance tax and premium. Uh, the U.S. Department of Labor early on said that they would not accept that particular tax. Uh, the legislators decided to promote it anyway and to get it passed and then the governor uh, vetoed it. Uh, in this budget climate, the reality is there will be very few, if any, new programs and initiatives. What we will have to do is to take some existing resources, re-envision those resources, one of the things I'd like to say as I close, we must take many of these 20th century programs and retrofit them to address 21st century problems. That's the way we can use the Georgia Works Initiative and other existing tax credits. I pulled down the list from Craig's uh, old uh, department. We have a slew of tax credits already on the book. And we just need to help small business folk and other folk be able to access them and administer them so they can be so they can benefit them. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Commissioner, for your, your leadership and your friendship. Uh, 
that shows he, he really walks the talk in bipartisanship. That was some, you know, unfortunately news media didn't really report that, but that Jobs Act was a great bipartisan effort last year, uh, working with Commissioner Thurman on the, some of those credits for the unemployed and some other tax cuts. And um, so that's just a, a good example. He's always been very generous with his time. He's spoken to many leadership Georgia classes, and he spoke to the first class, graduating class of Tech High, which we really appreciate. Motivated me so much I was ready to go back and sign up for college again.